Christian community in the Holy Land needs a higher profile in this country, and so it seemed right to us that we should try to increase that profile and develop what I think I referred to in the opening yesterday as a more literate and compassionate understanding of the situation of Christians in the Holy Land. This project was very warmly supported by Pope Benedict, with whom I discussed it personally during his visit last year, and it has, of course, the backing of both our churches in this country. We're privileged to have a number of young people from all three faiths of the Holy Land, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, who share their experience with us together, sometimes in very, very moving ways. I think for both of us, the experience of listening to these younger people talking about their possible futures was among the most challenging and moving aspects of the last 48 hours. Much to one, we didn't attempt to offer a comprehensive overview of one of the most complex situations on the face of the globe. Archbishop Rohn mentioned the presence of a few young people, and in many ways it was their testimony that was the most heartfelt. For example, one young Palestinian Christian explained to us how it took him quite a while to work out that his identity was not simply Palestinian, or not simply Christian, but it was a Palestinian Christian. Noting uh, some of the Jewish voices present spoke of the presence of Christians as a moderating influence in the Middle East. Uh, great emphasis was laid on the theme of hospitality to the stranger, which is common to the three faiths who were present. Archbishop Rome gave it a very strong launch last week at the General Synod, and it becomes an ecumenical charity in which we hope, through which we hope that in lots of our parishes there will be small groups of people who are committed to being friends of the Holy Land and it will be a commitment to support the people of the Holy Land in prayer, to inform themselves and to become more aware of the reality of the situation and to offer financial support in very practical ways. I think that means that we are looking for a bit of a step change in Christian involvement here with the situation of Christians in the Holy Land. A step change that will allow us to identify and support specific projects more effectively. And because those are projects not simply for the churches in the Holy Land, but for the communities that those churches are embedded in, we don't see this as an exclusively Christian enterprise. It's quite a lot of discussion, but the notion that access to holy places could be restricted was one that was, I think, universally felt to cut against the very principle of religious liberty. And that was acknowledged by Jewish people present as well as others. So this has been very much a focus. I think one of the major things that's going to come out of this is a renewed stress on pressing for both better guaranteed access <laughs> to the holy sites, particularly at the great festivals, and also raising issues about residence, about the breaking up family units which present restrictions uh, affect very adversely. So there was no uh, avoidance of that particular issue. We haven't discussed the question of boycott, and that was a deliberate decision, I think, in the last two days. <coughs> in the last two days, we wanted to focus specifically on the positive means we could take to support communities under pressure. As we've sketched it, that it is to ensure that this is uh, not simply the opportunity to go and see the historic sites of Jesus' life and ministry, and indeed of the whole, the, the, the Old Testament context, uh, and, and which is so important to understanding the, the, the life of Jesus. But it's also a place, in, a, an opportunity to go and engage with the faith. I think um, the Roman Catholic Patriarch of Jerusalem put it even more strongly when he said that the risk was of a Christian Disneyland being left. Since you just said that time is running out for a two-state solution, I wonder if you could also enlarge on, on what you think the consequences of that are. Um, very briefly, I think what we've heard is that the aspiration for two pluralist, democratic, law-governed states side by side in the region is a positive aspiration. The loss of that is something which has not just local but 
regional and global consequences. We didn't set out to solve political problems, um, and so it's not very surprising that we haven't. <laughs> that wasn't the focus, because I think one of the things that was very much around in our minds was broad brush pictures and high level rhetoric <coughs> are quite easy in this situation. What we need to do, and we heard this many times yesterday, was to focus on problems that might be solved, things that might be made a little better. Can we press on the issue of access, for example? Can we press on the practicality of certain specific projects? The settlements question was, of course, in everyone's mind, and the sense that settlements represented one of those great threats to a two-state solution, in the way that most people have spoken about. But we didn't set ourselves to produce a political resolution. Both Christians and Muslims have work to do on them. 